Hi friends, welcome back to a true crime story, a brand new one with your girl Yinka Bikini. Uh, this is the place where I stick 10 minutes on the clock and try to tell you as much about a case as possible. We are using a different countdown timer aesthetic to last week, but please let me know what you think of this one in the comments. I'm still trialing the clock countdown thing, so feedback is both needed and appreciated, but here we go. 10 minutes. Welcome to the anniversary. Today we are taking it to London for a bit of homegrown true crime. Gemma McCluskey was best known for her role as Kerry Skinner in EastEnders in the early 2000s. She had the role between 2000 and 2001. But it was this week, nine years ago, that her life would be cut short. She was first reported missing on March 1st, 2012. She'd been last seen at her home in a flat in East London in Shoreditch that she shared with her brother Tony. After a few days, Tony and their other brother, Danny, reported her missing to the police. They went to the police station and they filed a missing persons report because it was unlike Gemma to just go missing to disappear off the face of the earth. After leaving EastEnders way back in 2001, Gemma went back to normal life. She worked in a pub and she was 29 at the time of her disappearance and death. Her case, unfortunately, wasn't super high on the police's agendas. They deemed it as low risk because even though she'd never been reported missing before, she was an adult who wasn't categorised as particularly vulnerable. And you'll find this with quite a few missing persons cases if you watch documentaries or listen to podcasts, that it isn't illegal for someone to decide they want to out, they want to get the hell out of Dodge and start a new life, even if they don't tell their loved ones. If there aren't any suspicious circumstances around the disappearance, the police will investigate, but just not with the vim that the family, of course, would want them to. Looking at it objectively, of course, you have to factor in cuts and budgets and all that sort of stuff. They're not going to pump all their money into finding Gemma when she could have just off skied. But it turns out in this case, she didn't. The police started routine missing person inquiries. But two days later, there was still no sign of her, and this is when her family, her two brothers, Tony, Danny, and her dad, became really, really concerned. They held an appeal at a local pub. The whole family, including Tony, who was the brother that she lived with, did everything they could to help with the police investigation. A hundred people, I think it was, went on a search for Gemma. They printed flyers, all of the sort of stuff that you would expect if a loved one goes missing. Tony, who was the brother who she lived with, began receiving sinister phone calls, claiming to be from a kidnapper, demanding a huge ransom. And when this happened, it switched the gears of the investigation. Police now had a reason to step it up, and Gemma's case became high priority. Maybe she hadn't wandered off after all. The police quickly found out that the calls were actually a hoax. It was from a 19-year-old boy in Croydon, and just to wrap up his spin-off, because we're not going to give him a whole hour to himself, he would eventually, after everything came to its conclusion, be jailed for six months for being a prick in this instance. But within hours, of the calls that came through to Tony's phone. A suitcase was found in Regent's Canal in London and it had a torso in it. There were no arms, there were no legs, there was no head, it was just a torso. A suitcase was found in a nearby canal. Inside, a female torso. It was Gemma. And our missing persons inquiry turned into a murder investigation because that torso belonged to Gemma McCluskey. The canal was searched and the police decided that since he was the last person to see her alive, they had to re-interview her brother Tony. And they treated him as a significant witness, not as a suspect, he wasn't cautioned, but he was the main lead. He reiterated the initial story that he told the police. Him and his sister had a small argument and he last saw her in the afternoon of the day that she went missing. While the police went and grabbed Tony and brought him back in for questioning, they also brought other witnesses who had seen Gemma in and around the area, people who knew her in for questioning too. They were being interviewed. And there were just small things about Tony's account that didn't add up. There were small inconsistencies in what he said happened compared to what everyone else said happened. And since he is the link, he's the reason that she was reported missing, the police were very suspicious. Tony was arrested for the murder of his sister. He quickly became Mr. No Comment. Quickly, like it was like a flip of a switch. And when he went from being witness to suspect, his personality completely changed. Tony, did you kill Gemma? No comment. 
tell me about what you know about the, the disappearance of Gemma. No comment. For me, if I was arrested, God forbid, for the murder of one of my siblings, and I definitely didn't do it, I would be providing as much information as possible. I wouldn't be throwing my toys out the pram, I wouldn't be pouting, I wouldn't be throwing a tantrum, I would be singing like a canary. Because A, I would want my name cleared, and B, it's my sibling, I want you to find the person responsible. Of course I always say in this that you never know how you're going to act until these things happen to you, but I genuinely believe that if something happened to one of my siblings, I would just be happy the police are doing their job and I would be giving them names, dates, I would be going hypnotising, just trying to think about what it is that I'm missing out that could connect the dots in this story. Not saying no comment, no comment, no comment, and quite rightly so. Tony becoming the Duke of No Comment Shire really raised red flags for the police. And it was 10 days after Gemma disappeared that Tony McCluskey, her brother, was charged with her murder. Officers found CCTV of Gemma on the morning that she went missing. She was walking around town, she was driving her car back home, and she had been left in charge of the family home in Shoreditch, East London, when her mother Pauline was hospitalised with an MRSA infection after surgery. And the morning that she went missing, she went to the opening of the new Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel. It's all documented, but she was never seen on CCTV after going home. The police forensically searched the flat where the pair lived, and there was blood and human tissue all over the joint and it matched Gemma's DNA. Police realised that Gemma was dead before she was even reported missing. They pulled up Tony's phone records and they saw that the day after his sister was last seen he had called a taxi. So they tracked the movements of that cab. They found CCTV of my man getting out of it at the entrance of the canal carrying a heavy bag. This guy is dragging this bag and it looked eerily similar to the one that Gemma's torso was found in. He drags it to the canal and then he's later seen on CCTV walking back to his flat without the bag. They managed to track down the car and tests showed that Gemma's blood was in the boot. Imagine being that taxi driver. Imagine, you're just there trying to make some money and a man's got a body in your boot and you didn't even know, you're just at home, they come, can we search your car? Whatever, blood. Oh. And this, this fact actually doesn't surprise me, but Tony's family, the rest of Gemma's family, would not believe that he had anything to do with the murder. It's a pretty tall order though, because you're asking siblings and parents to believe that their son, their brother, would do something so heinous. But, when they saw the CCTV of Tony carrying the bag, it's a really short clip, that Gemma's body would be found in, there was no more doubt in anybody's mind. If he was banged to rights, he was guilty in everyone's eyes. And this is what we know about the circumstances of Gemma's death. The argument that would result in her being killed and dismembered by her own brother started over taps. Taps, common household taps. He had left them running and the sink had overflown in the flat that they shared. There was a lot of friction between them already. Tony was a heavy cannabis user and the siblings fought often. Reports that I've read, and I'll link everything in the description box, kind of lean toward them being like chalk and cheese, to be honest. Gemma was really motivated, she was super clean cut, and Tony just not so. Gemma had left the flat, and that's when we see her on all that CCTV, but then when she returned, the fight continued. Tony claims that he has no recollection of what he actually did to Gemma after punching her to the ground. He really thought that he would get away with murder though, reporting her missing to the police, going to the sun, holding up missing posters, saying, please help me find my sister. He even texted her, knowing that she was dead, playing the part of the worried brother. And he genuinely thought that he got lucky with those fake blackmail calls because the investigation led the police away from him. I've read articles that I will link in the description and they say that although the day Gemma died would of course be the last time that Tony physically attacked her, that it wasn't the first. Friends described him as controlling, as jealous, uh, said that she had a black eye one time, she said it was Tony. When they were shocked, she then backtracked and said it was an accident. These are in tabloids, but I'll link them and you can have a read and you can decide for yourself whether or not this was a random outburst or it was a culmination of years and years of abuse and violence. These claims by her mates just make this all the more heartbreaking. Tony pleaded guilty to uh, manslaughter, not murder, at his trial. He claimed that in an argument Gemma was telling him to leave the flat, that he punched her to the ground, he grabbed her wrist and he had no recollection of what had happened. He doesn't remember how she died, he doesn't remember spending hours dismembering her body, but he was found guilty of murder. Um, it took six months for her entire body to be recovered. 
So her torso first, a few days after she went missing, and then her legs and arms a few days after that. But it, her head wasn't found until September of 2012, six months. And it was on the same stretch of canal as well. A pathologist listed her cause of death as blunt force trauma and said that she was struck at least twice to the head with a blunt instrument. Tony was sentenced to life in prison and he has to serve a minimum of 20 years. This one is probably one of the most shocking cases because it's super rare that you hear about siblings doing this sort of stuff to each other. And there you have it, our 10 minutes are up and I've told you everything that I can about the case of Gemma McCluskey. The EastEnders actress who was reported missing nine years ago this week and her body was found dismembered in Regent's Canal. The investigation culminated very close to home and her brother is serving life in prison for her murder. Thank you for watching. Of course, like, comment, subscribe, all of that stuff. Let me know what you think of this new clock stuff. Read all of the um, notes in the description and I will see you next week. Long laundry list of things to do there. Homework. See you guys later.